All right, thanks. There's too much talking. I'm explaining for a minute. I'm sorry about that. I, I really don't think uh, I'm getting married. I, I don't think I could take the noise. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Saints, where are we? Any questions? Don't you miss me? Where's, where is he? Another car show? Yeah. <coughs> I could just see him standing in front of the Lord. How are the car shows, Pam? All right. <laughs> Okay, uh, if you go with me to um, Luke chapter 14, verse 25, down through 33, um, turn to the person next to you and say, this is going to change your life. This is going to change your life. Okay. If you, if you, hear, if you hear what this says, you are not going to look like this anymore. All right. <laughs> and, and people, um, people like um, they're listening to our Bible study from Sunday night. Oh yeah. I don't know. Betty was over with me yesterday and we listened to it again. She loved it. Now she's sharing with others. Uh, what else? In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, all God's people said. Amen. Amen. Father, we, we praise you for discipleship and. What a call you have on our lives to do what you're going to remind us to do in Luke's Gospel. So Lord, I ask you to give us ears to hear and the strength and the Spirit to do it. Glory be to the Father. And to the Son and, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit as it was in the beginning, beginning is now, now, and ever shall be, world without end. end. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, all God's people said. Amen. Okay. Um, Luke chapter 14, verse 25, the cost of discipleship. The, what I discovered as I'm studying what our master says here is we really are not very good disciples. We are not really, we don't understand. And I think these verses, when I understood what Jesus is trying to say, they're going to change your life if you hear what they're going to do. And how many know you can't live the way you've been living before you came in here? All right, you got that? Yeah. Now, great multitudes accompany him. Now, if, if, again, if you circle the word um, um, great, how do you say that in Greek? Mega, very good. Mega. And when, when the multitudes follow Jesus, when the multitudes follow Jesus, they are never converted to him. And this is going to take us way beyond what I have done a million times, and I'll probably do it a million more times, is the traditional altar call. That's very good, but it doesn't make disciples. People can get on a spiritual high. How many ever been on a spiritual high weekend? But when you go back to Monday activities, it's like you've never been on that weekend. So the great multitudes accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, Now there's going to be three times the key, I hope you know, is the word, my disciple. That's in verse uh, 26, verse 27, and verse 38. If you are my disciples. So what's the illusion there? The illusion is there were other disciples out there, weren't there? Now, I believe this word is not for the faint of heart. I believe this is those who are very serious about your faith and your commitment. After I, I studied this, I went, wow. Now, if anyone comes to me, now, if you box that in there, it comes to me, and does not hate, well, we're going to give you a big explanation what the word hate means hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, cannot be my disciple. So if you underline the word, my disciple. So 
it says there that we got to come to him. So this is an invitation. And every time you see that expression, come to me, and you know the famed one in Matthew eleven twenty eight, come to me, all you who are heard. So come to me is, it means an invitation to salvation. So by being a disciple, you're being saved. Now interestingly, in this sh short passage, you're not going to hear repenting of sins and everything else, though that's definitely included. You're going to hear through that what that means. Jesus has been called a rabbi, or in, in, in terms today, you might hear this expression, a rabbi. But he did not follow the format of the first century. The reason why he was called a Rebbe, as we dis discussed the background of discipleship, because he had followers. And so when you see this big multitude following him, they're not going to embrace these words. I believe these words are the key to see if you're a disciple. Okay? Now, a disciple should be equivalent with the word um, Christian. Now, to understand what's going on here, you've got to understand going all the way back to chapter 12 of Luke. And what happened in chapter 12 of Luke, nationally, Jesus was rejected by Israel. Does everybody know that? Now, can you understand why he's going to say, my disciple? So he's nationally rejected. There were people who were pre-invited to the banquet. We, we studied the banquets before. Remember we did uh, the, uh, the banquets in one study. Uh, in, we went through all the Jesus sitting down at table. They were pre-invited. But now when their invitation comes forward, they say no. We don't want to go. Everyone here has received an invitation through the mail, many things, many weddings, but we all didn't go. For one reason or another. So the first thing I want us to know is the nation rejected him. So now Jesus comes and says, who wants to be my disciples? Because by being my disciples, it's not religion as you once knew it. And right now, when I look at our church, I absolutely cry. Because what I hear and even what I just heard tonight, the liberality is incredible. It's not the church you and I grew up in. What people are doing. The, the religious leaders were falling apart or taking on their own power. In, in, in the Gospel of Luke here, in this passage, Jesus is going to use extreme language. Mm -hmm. There are three major parts to being a disciple. Tonight we'll look at part one. If you, part number one, if we're going to be a disciple, we must, and did you hear that word must? We must abandon our past priorities. Can we do that? Can we abandon our past priorities? Another definition of the gospel is things are about to change for you. We're going to learn now that there are three levels of past priorities. Yourself, your family, and your, your stuff or your possessions. Well, 
when Jesus says, my disciples, in Luke chapter 12, the nation rejects him. Here's what he's saying to us today. We've got to get rid of phony religion. Behind the scenes, I see it all the time. We've got to get rid of, um, we've got to be prepared to be under divine scrutiny. Our lives are going to be an open book in front of God. We've got to fe fear God and make sure we know He's holy. What this is about, to be a disciple of Jesus, is not a makeover, but a takeover. <laughs> it is not a little prayer accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior and run down saying you're a Christian. That's just not all of it, right? That is just not all. There's a whole lot more. In fact, I, I've been involved in Billy Graham Crusades and some of you have been with me in the Meadowlands. And when that happened, I discovered those who do accept Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. Do you know how many uh, worldwide find themselves going to a church? One to two percent. Ninety-eight percent fall out. I like crusades. I love doing them myself. I did a big rally in Ocean Grove, a couple thousand people. I'm glad I could inspire people, but there's a whole lot more than that. Right? What Jesus is calling us to do is look at yourself as the subject. What this is going to be is absolutely, radically going to change your life. So, what it, what's got to change about your life? Number one, I got to change. Number two, the priority of my family's got to change. Number three, the stuff that I have has got to change. I've got to give up my past priorities. How many want to be a disciple now? Being a disciple does not immediately call for additions, but what? Subtractions. Subtractions. So how many here want to be have a subtraction in your life? Now I, I like the word, and, and we're gonna we're gonna really spend a lot of time on that word. If you look with me in verse number 26, if anyone comes to me, circle the word if. What does the word if mean? There are conditions. God loves us. That is, you'll never see the word if God loves me. If you are my disciple, they are conditions. Does everybody see that? Comes to me. And does not hate. Now, we're going to explore right now the word hate. You see, a reason, incorrectly, you were told not to read the Bible. Because without any background, if you read the word hate, what would you think it meant? Hate. That means i got to hate my parents. See how you would blow that way out of context. But you got to understand the language of the day and the background. Let's look at that background because there's a lot to say just on that one word and I think we're going to land there probably for most of our session. Okay, so if you hate. So I got good news for you. It doesn't mean what you think it means if I said the word hate. It doesn't mean that. Okay? So when you read the Bible, remember our rule is when you look, read a Bible in English, never think that the word may necessarily mean what you think it means in English or Tagalog. You got that rule? Don't think, or Polish. Don't think it necessarily means that. It may, but when you look at the original language, probably not. So, you could see me down south preaching during the Civil War. I could be preaching that you could have slaves, and I could show you a Bible passage. And guess what? You think I'm the best preacher going. 
because I'm not going to tell you not to have slaves down south, right? How many know I'll be running out of ministry? Amen? So, <coughs> let's look at the word hate. And hear what Jesus is saying. The word hate, from the Greek, but even more so from the Hebrew, is expresses the word preference. Boy, that's a strange meaning, isn't it? Yeah. It's preference. It's a Hebrew expression meaning, who do you prefer? We all know that nowhere do we believe that Jesus is going to say, hate your parents. But isn't that, if you read it in English, doesn't it say that? So nobody is going to preach to you, hopefully in this modern era of ours, that says, hate your parents. That would not fit discipleship. But here's what it means. It means that there is, compared to God, I must love you less. But yet I must love you with the love of God. Are you getting this? Everyone here should love God above all. But what does that mean in my relationship to you? Does that mean I love you less? No. What it means is, when everything about my life is shown, I should always be serving God, no matter what, before any decisions I have with you. If you said, I think it's a good idea that you divorce your husband or your wife. So, well, what does God say on that? No. no. So guess what? I'm not going to listen to you and I'm going to obey God because I love Him more than what you just said. Do you understand? So I'm going to hate what you said because my preference is with God. We're going to look at some ideas of this idea of hate in the Bible, okay? We're going to go backwards, make a left go to Malachi. Sister Marie, what does Malachi mean? My messenger, very good. Go to Malachi chapter 1, verse 2. If you're my disciple, you must hate your parents. What does that mean? Whatever God says I do before even my parents, does that make sense to you now? A very popular thing going on, if you're invited to a interesting wedding today, and you got to say, I'm not going to that wedding because I love God. I can't go to that wedding because I love God. That is the sense of hating. Okay? Again, do not think in the English context that you hate the person. Everybody with me, Malachi? Mm -hmm. Go to chapter 1, please. Verse number uh, 2. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how has that loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord. Yet I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. Does God hate Esau? No. In our old thinking, what does it mean? He says, I prefer Jacob over Esau. Now, does God prefer people over other people when they have a heart to obey Him? So the preference and the blessing will flow to us, as Deuteronomy 28 says. So what does this mean? Let me show you another one. Go back, all the way back, all the way back to Genesis 29. All the way back to Genesis. All the way back to Genesis 29. When we, when we say the Bible like this, we, we understand the Bible better, don't we? Go to verse 31. Genesis. No wonder why it doesn't look familiar. I'm mean, looking at the book of Exodus. It doesn't look like. Genesis 29. 31. Genesis 29, 31. 
Genesis 29, 31. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. What is the, what it hated mean? It's a Hebrew expression for the preference. Does everybody got a sense what hated means now? Yeah. All right, we're going to build on just what the word hate means now. So if we're going to abandon my past priorities, top priorities, myself, my family, and my, my stuff, my, my possessions. If I do that, I got to say, I, I, I love God above everything. Yes? My whole heart, soul, body, and strength. Remember in Hebrew, the word strength means your finances. A lot of people do not get that right. They think the strength there means your muscles. It doesn't mean your muscles, it means your finances. Okay? Now, we're looking at the word hate. God has to be loved exclusively. Here's what it means. Jesus is saying, if you're, see that, my disciple, you must not, there's unshared love that you have with me that another person does, that you don't have with others. I don't go around saying to every person, I will obey you no matter what. I don't know if you ever said to your son in Florida, I will obey you no matter what. You don't say that. So, but what, what do you say to God? I will obey you no matter what. So, and that's the context of hate. It means that there are, in my walk with God, unshared love that I have for God that I don't have for you. I talk to God every day. I don't talk to you every day. I praise and worship Him every day. I do not praise and worship you. So there's part of my love that I have for God that you can never have. That's what Jesus means by love. Now watch this, Sister Murray. No, I think you just answered it because I was questioning something. I, I, I saw your praise and worship is my intimacy. Here's what it means, the word hate. We're called to, Jesus says, love me that you make me everything. I believe as believers in Jesus, we are not full time with him. We can pray with one another now and lay hands with other people. But would we do that in public? Not necessarily. Would we suggest that to another person? Not necessarily. I know like you're saying to me, I don't cast my pearls before swine. They don't want it, they don't get it from me. But there's times that we can easily turn off our Christianity. Now, when you're a disciple, you can't turn it off. So when you hate, in this context, within the Hebrewism, when you hate, you, Jesus says, you gotta love me to the degree that I am everything. How many believe you're already there, that he's everything? He's absolutely everything. Now, go with me to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verse 27. Luke chapter 10, verse 27. When we read this, and we read this many times before, would you put a little extra note in there? This is God's exclusivity. Chapter 10, verse 27. He says to us. Everybody with me? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. 
And he said to them, you have answered right, do this and you will live. This is exclusivity. So if the, the expression hate means there are certain duties I have toward God, not to you. And we can give we can give a mild list of what my duties are. That's what it means to hate. Now, when I do this and hate in this context, then I have an amazing grace that falls upon me. The amazing grace is I now no longer say, my people are never, never, never my top priority. God is. How many marriages do you know have been built like that? I have to scratch my head to see if I can think of any. How many would like to have been married like that? Where it's God alone. It's God alone. Again, this is going to challenge us. So your priority is family is not first. When you're married, you've got to say to your spouse, anybody ever get married here? You've got to say to your spouse, you are not number one in my life. God is. How many would still be married now? Go home, tell your spouses that you're not number one. God is. Would, would, they, would they be mad at you? Would they? What happens to the three and two and one? No, one plus one <laughs> plus one equals one. You got that? Now what this means to us is to say, what happens here, if I under, does everybody understand this expression hate? Yes? Why did whoever it was who translated this Bible use, use that word hate? Because for us, anybody, when you right. get the word hate, it's like... Because, because Sister Alice, that's the word. But you see, you see there is, there is a Hebrewism. They have colloquialisms. Like, growing up, you heard your children or grandchildren, or we always say, your mother's going to what? Kill you. <laughs> now, everybody here knows what that means. We don't expect Mrs. Jones to take a gun and shoot her kid. So, we have our expression. So, in Hebrew, this was their expression to say, God has no equals in your life with anyone else, yourself, your family, and you're stuck. So Remember now, Jesus is now saying, this is, this is getting divorce papers, so to speak, from Israel. He says, if you be my disciple. Sister Ray. So, to, when you're saying to hate, you, you, when you look at that word, you're saying to yourself, God is number one in my life. That's right. So I prefer God over whatever. Who yes. Is. My preference is always for God. And when you do that in today's context, you're going to upset a lot of people. Yes. Or the bell? It's, it's almost like fear. Yes. Fear of the Lord. We used to think that was to yes. be afraid of God, but yet it means reverence. Yes. So it's kind of like the same thing. Yes. It doesn't mean what it yes. I think it means. Yes. Now, when I do this in the Spirit, there's an amazing thing that happens. I get what is called sustaining grace. I get sustaining grace. I'm going to break that down more. How many want to be sustained for the rest of your life? If I'm going to make a statement, if I'm a disciple of Jesus, and I went into my house and say, by the way, Jesus is number one in here. Nobody's number one. And i got duties to Him that you will never have. Because i, I got to worship Him, I'm not going to worship you. i got to put Jesus number one. And I look at my past life, and that's been some of my suffering, because he's, he's got to be number one. I look at my past life, and I could have been friends with a whole lot more different clergy, but if I were them, and there are a lot of great people to be around with, guess what? I would have to sacrifice what I believe. And as a result, from some of the good people I was in seminary with, I can't be near them right now. If I told you what they told me, I'm like, 
I said, no, my preference is for God. So as a result, I don't go near Father X, Y, and Z. Amen? So, in that sense, I need to be sustained. When you get this grace, you are sustained. And here's the sustaining power. It means at this moment, you will have an absolute power in the Holy Spirit to strengthen you. Absolutely. Now here's what it means. It means that all of our desires prior to this moment, ready? All of your desires prior to this moment were warped. All of your desires prior to this moment were corrupted. Listen to what Paul says in Philippians 3, 8. Now you understand what Paul means in Philippians 3, 8. Everything is garbage. Everything is absolute garbage compared to knowing Jesus Christ. Let's face it. Right now, all the people, a lot of people in this town are just doing what right now? Wasting their time. Yeah. How many know most of our lives is a whole waste of life? Yeah. Let's be honest again. Most of the people we will encounter are not living. They're surviving. They, they don't have any sustaining grace. Right? The people that come to churches weekly are living so much in the flesh they can't wait to get out of there because their flesh is dictating to them. Keep it quick and get out. Right? Now, this is an important point. This is the point that gets me excited about the heating principle. I hope everybody who hears this teaching doesn't come in the middle of it because I'm not teaching anybody to hate, right? Uh, here's the hating principle now. This, this is so good. Ready? Okay. When you, what Jesus is saying to us if you're going to be a disciple, you've got to end your reign and the authority over your life. You've got to stop reigning in your life. How many think you could do that? No more reigning in your life. Anybody want to be there? Now Jesus appears to speak negatively. He, is, he appears negative with the if because discipleship is dead serious. And I put that word in there, dead serious, because it may lead you to your death. Yeah. Right now, around the world, martyrdom is increasing in leaps and bounds. It is presently in the United States of America. We have ceased a few years ago since this present day administration has entered we have ceased to be a Christian nation. We are no longer a Christian nation. We are going to face momentarily unbelievable persecution. We're hearing it subtly, verbally. Right now, Israel is attacking Palestine. Does everybody know there's riots breaking out right now around the world? In Paris, in the UK, and, it, 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 it's, and they're saying, kill the Jews. So here we go again. So we're living in persecution, and I believe we're heading toward another Holocaust. I believe the church is so liberal, it's heading toward an underground. You and I now got to decide to be disciples. Now, when Jesus says, to us. Is this making sense? If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, box that in there, that's family. Your family cannot be a priority over the gospel. Does that include everybody? Did we get everybody in there? Is that everybody you love? He goes on to say there, even his own life, there's your own life. You cannot have your life as a priority. So you've got to say, Galatians 2.20, I don't live, but Christ crucified lives in me. He cannot be my disciple. So every time Jesus says, my disciple, it's with a negative connotation. You don't do this. You are not my disciple. 
if where you live and work, if you don't have preference for me and everything you do with yourself, with your family, with your stuff, you're not my disciple. Right now, I believe we are fooling ourselves thinking we are. I don't think there's a person that goes to a church on Sunday that doesn't think they're a Catholic. I was just talking to a woman, she, um, and she says, you know what, I don't believe in purgatory. I said, well, you know what, you're not a Catholic. She just looked at me with a nervous laugh that they're making up their own rules and there's regulations, right? I can see one reason why she said that. They're being taught nothing. They're being taught, they're not being taught in, in their faith. They just want a nice talk for less than five minutes. I hear people rejoicing. Oh, thank God, we got a new priest. Everything's under five minutes in the Hamla. Wow. They're rejoicing over that fact. Can they hear what they're saying? And yet they think they're on the way to life. Now when you hate like this, here's what Jesus is saying. I have no rights. No rights. Secondly, I don't hold anything for myself. By the way, the end of this is going to be spectacular when you see anybody who does this. Thirdly, I, I will never do what I want. Fourthly, I will pay the highest cost. Fifthly, I will abandon myself. I will, I will abandon myself. If possible, I will be alienated from family and my stuff. What Jesus is doing by giving us this statement is taking every one of us away from superficiality. What we're going to hear now in this small passage, it's called narrow gate evangelism. Enter through the narrow gate. Do you think if I preach this on Sunday, everybody would be cheering me? No, no. You make it still. <laughs> when you, sixthly, when you have sustaining grace, you must deny what you crave. How many could do that? I'm so glad Joan's taking me out for an ice cream sundae with whipped cream and chocolate cream. fudge. Cream. How many here understand what hate means now? How many here want to be a disciple now? How many think we have taught our people how to do this? That's why I believe when the time does come, push into shove or shove into push, how many disciples will there be? You got it, very few. Now you understand Jesus' words, that the way is narrow and few therein will be saved. Yes. So it's like the remnant. It's the remnant, you got it. I want to give you, I, I want to jump ahead real quick and go right back. Verse 33. Chapter 14, verse 33. So therefore, whoever of you does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. I, I want to give you the Greek word. You, you'll get a kick out of the Greek word. The Greek word is Apostosaso. Apostasso. Apostasso. Now look at the word renounce. Everybody see that in your Bible? I know I'm that. Now listen to what Jesus says there. 
You know what it means? This this is it means it's kind of funny. Oh. Uh, I, I like this word. And when do we do this? Anybody ever been to a baptism? No. What do we say? Do you renounce they Satan? Do you renounce all his seductions? Did you know everybody says yes? Yeah. And all his empty promises. You know everybody says yes? Yeah. Here's what it means. Well, let's put it in English for you. So therefore, whoever of you does not... Here, here's the Greek note. Say goodbye to all that you have cannot be my disciple. Now did you see did you see this my disciples in there three times? Are you getting there? So how many here and we're only on point one. How many understand the concept of feeding? How many understand the call of discipleship? I think tonight is going to make us or break us. To really make us think who we are and what Jesus really, really means. Yes, sir? Yeah, uh, so uh, the conclusion of this is uh, saying uh, we have to die to ourselves. Uh, yes, that's why you see the next part coming up. Everything that we Reconditioning. <laughs> I mean, come on. Yeah. Something as simple as that. Yeah. Father Bill, thank you. Can you give the apostasis? <laughs> is the is the definition in Greek for renounce? Yeah. When you break that down. I mean, say goodbye. But if it's also saying apostle, I mean. Apostle, apostle is to send. Is to, to Apost to, apostolos is to send. To send. Right. Oh, so then you're saying say right. if you want to be here. Okay. <laughs> so, to renounce means to say, bye. Okay, thank you. And you don't say, we'll see you later. <laughs> bye. In Deuteronomy 17, God says you're going back to Egypt. When they left Egypt, what should they have said? But guess what? Their lifestyle went back to Egypt. And guess what? The reason why we lost this great country is because we went back to idolatry. We don't trust God. Oh, um, it, it's just absolutely terrible. Now, what this means is this. What about the things that I do need to live? Let's answer that real quick and then we'll continue. The things you need to live. Say some of you drive a car. The things you need to live is you've got to understand from a discipleship, I am a steward of everything that God gives me. I'm only a steward. In reality, here's the teaching. You own nothing. That's why that prosperity gospel is ridiculous. It's poison. It's abominable. I consider myself minuscule compared to who God is. Does this make sense to everybody? Yes. So far so good? Yes. Back to chapter 14, verse 26. If anyone comes to me, invitation, Luke 14, verse 26, does not hate, we understood hate, right? Right. It means preferential. His own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Underline mine. <clears throat> now, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me. Did we hear come after me? Now watch this. Let me show you something. Look, look where it says in verse 26, come to me. Look at verse 27. Connect the two comes. Come after me. So, what does it mean? I'm supposed to give a talk tomorrow night. And I don't know what I'm saying. Maybe this is what I'm going to say. Uh, the talk is guidance. What's, the, what's Jesus saying? And again, you see in John 10. I'm the shepherd, you are the sheep. 
So what are you going to do? You've got to follow after him day by day by day by day. Do you see the connection? Come to me. Come after me. So the, the context is I'm leading, you follow. Okay? Are you getting this? So how many disciples do you know? That's why some people say, you know what your problem is? Again, I told you this story many times. You talk about Jesus too much. It's because I'm following him. You know why? I talk about him all the time. I got a front row seat. Do you know every day, every day in church, do you know I get a front row seat? Do you know I'm the only person in church that gets the best seat? And I get the best stand too? Do you know that? I get the best seat? So if you really believe he's there, and I do, what am I going to do? I'm going to talk about what I've just seen. I'm coming after him. I love this. I love the connection that Jesus draws here. you you got to see this. you, you got to see that come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, we go to, we go to the cross. The cross means there's a martyrdom involved. Martyrdom, as you remember many times, means witnessing for Christ. It doesn't mean necessarily dying, but it can include that. And I believe the greatest martyrdom is yet to come. During the Great Tribulation, people are going to be martyred left and right. <coughs> In the Middle East, it's going on right now in a town called Mosul in Iraq. It used to be a Christian stronghold, maybe about 15, 1600 Catholic Eastern Christians. Today, how many are in town? Nobody. It is a ghost town. They, they came in and they destroyed, by the way, you know, people say Jonah was only a myth. But guess what? The Muslims just knocked out where he was buried. They destroyed Jonah's tomb. Right now, the whole Middle East is in a furor. Syria, Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, the things are really shaking. I believed in my heart that when the appearance of the red moon came, I believe, and I told you, Israel's going to war. It's begun. And when I heard this past week, Egypt, or two weeks ago, wanted peace, I just said in my spirit, they're not getting it. And guess what? They didn't get it. I wish peace upon the Middle East. That is my prayer. Now, when you have the cross, it means, the cross means, you've got to come to me with your very breath. It means that when you're on a cross, there's only one cross per person. When you're on a cross, you're the only one on it. When you're on the cross, you're all by yourself. Everybody in this room felt at least once in your life by yourself. But I go to church. I go to Bible study. I go to prayer group. I've been to conferences. Is that true? Everybody in this room felt at least by yourself, alone? How could that happen of everything that you and I are learning? So our blessed Lord says to us here, whoever does not bear his own cross, the reality is, if I'm a disciple, I'm going to have to have moments by myself with God. When you're in on the cross, you're by yourself, you're in your own pain, nobody is there. Please, God, may it never cause you to be despairing and say, where are they? I've been going through a very interesting year. And I said to the clergy that was around me, who knew my story, I said to them very gently, I don't want to throw guilt on them, I said, brothers, for one year you hardly ever called me. And one father made a comment and he said, you've been brought low. 
you've been brought luck. But yet, that person never called me once. I gently reminded him, I said, would you do me a favor? Would you call me now and then? Just see how I'm doing. My old flesh said, don't ever call me. I know who you are. But the Holy Spirit broke through. When you take up the cross, it's martyrdom by yourself with God. This is you with God. Choosing the hate part. Understand my context? What we just went through. Choosing that part, and that's going to be you. So are you a disciple? Has everybody been there already? By yourself? Anybody yes. not been there? And those are the moments you just kind of just cry and cry and cry. So underline that there. And then you can see now, put those two together. Look what happens between come to me and then come after me. What's the first one? Come to me. What's the second one? Come after me. Do you see the difference? Now when I come to you, what do I gotta do? I gotta hate. I gotta pick up my cross. Come to me. I'm here. Alright, Bill. Welcome. Thank you, Lord. You gotta hate your family. Understand the context, of course. Okay, mom, my two brothers, you're not a priority above God. Okay? Okay, Lord, I took care of that. Now what? Okay, Bill? There's the cross. You've got to be alone on it. Okay? I pick up my cross. Okay, Bill? You passed? Thank you, Lord. Now, come after me. You got the picture? Is this clear? Anybody want to be a disciple now? Do you think upstairs gets it? I don't know many people who get this. Brother Max. Yeah, I, I have an experience with that. Um, when I, after I came back from Medjugorje, my, my life was turned around. Uh, 360 degrees, transformed. 365 means you're in the same circle. No, you mean 180? 360. That means you did, you're back where you were. Oh, it's, a, it's not the whole thing. You just, 360 is like this. You mean 180? 180. So, 180 means you're here and you're in a different direction. 360 means you make the full circle, you're back where you were. That was in 1990 and I gave up everything. You know, I was living in the world, you know, I was a real estate broker and then my, when I was going to church every day and uh, my family didn't understand what I was going through. And uh, even my wife, yeah. You know, and they don't they, understand. They, they if you can, if you come to me and come after me, nobody's going to understand. Yeah, it's hard to do. It, yeah, even my wife was jealous of what you know. Our, we have a fight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, some it, fights. Yeah, we did. I know. I, I Flair went to the gym afterwards and took up fisticuffs. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah, because uh, when I stumbled with the charismatic prayer group, right, she didn't want to come with me, and uh, right. he said she was going shopping, and yeah. Yes. Right. Are you getting this? Yeah. Father Bill, uh, other than, what is the difference between your priesthood and ours, other than the fact that you can bring Christ to us physically? Is there any other difference? I know you can hear up. Yes. Uh, mine, is, mine, mine is more identifying with Christ. Right. And it's more persecution than you can imagine. So then what's our priesthood? What your priest, priest, your priesthood is, is joining with me, of course. Okay. Uh, identifying and reigning with Christ, stating the obvious truths, and being persecuted for that. Okay. And living, living your life of purity, which will gain you access through the cross to heaven. Okay. Now, in one sense, I get more persecuted. In one sense, because the evil one wants to knock me out. Oh sure. If he knocks me out, 
you don't have anybody saying to you from a Catholic perspective, this is my body, this is my blood. Mm -hmm. I told them last night, the two biggest attacks right now going on, which has been for years, is the feminist agenda and a homosexual agenda. Right. Mm -hmm. They are rampant trying right. to destroy us. Right. And the clergy is kowtowing to both of them. Just, just recently, the, the bishop in Albany just said, lay people have got to stop preaching. Because they would have, uh, in Albany area, there would be a lot of lay preachers. And they're deeply saddened that they got to stop preaching. Yes, sir? Uh, there's a point on the cross where Jesus is not with God. He's really, truly alone. Yes. We did that last night, in, or... Sunday night in, in Luke 17, 11, he says, Father, I can't deal them, I can't take them anymore. They're yours. Right. Also on the cross, right. yes. my God, my God, thou hast forsaken me. But you got to understand that context. My God, my God, why are you forsaken me? You got to, when Jesus quotes Psalm 22, which that was, it's a psalm of triumph. When, you, when a part of, of the Bible is quoted, it's the whole thing. So you got to go all the way to the end of Psalm 22. It says, let all gener future generations praise me. But there had to be that separation for it to be complete, didn't there? That's a very Protestant view. Um, I mean, that they said the father, uh, the father did see the sins, but he was joined to Jesus. That's a Catholic view. A Protestant view says he just, for those moments, separated himself. Yes. No. Okay. Does so? Does everybody understand? Come to me and come after me. A difference, isn't there? You, you come know, to me. On the, build, on the cross, why was the earthquake then? On the cross, why was the earthquake? Right. Why did the earthquake? Because I think the Father breathed for His because, own. Because, because well. as, as the prophet Amos they, says, they, they, the prophet Amos says, because of what humanity was doing. Right. And also, too, there was another earthquake yeah, because it, it was continued death. in there because the seed of Jesus was going to go into the ground. You see, they had, there had to be an earthquake because the earth could not contain the divine seed. And the cross was on top of Adam's tomb. That's right. That's right. That's a crack. Right. That's right. And I was just here a few uh, months ago and it's still cracked. Right. So okay, okay, amen? Are you getting this? Thank you for me. Now, what this means, come to me, you could write in there, with every breath. Come after me with my life in you. See the difference? Can come to me also mean be my spouse? To be a spouse yes. to him? Yes. Yes. Right. But notice it's a big difference. Yes. A big difference. So we all have nice little stories about Jesus. We have so plasticized Jesus. Come to me. Nice. Children love that. And well, they should continue to hear that. That's right. But now, that we're growing up in the faith, come after me. Yeah. Whoa, whoa. We just, we just boxed in there for you. We just boxed in there for you what it really means now. Amen? Yes. Again, Paul says in Philippians 3, 8, everything is garbage. Mm -hmm. Now, we're ready for part two and to wrap things up a little bit here. If you need to turn that on, by all means, go ahead. Okay, if you want to come forward, that's good for next time. Yeah. If you're, yeah. you know, uh, warm, you're warm, right? Verse, uh, warm. verse 28. The second part, there's three points. Okay. Point number two. I, I love these. This is really good. Point number two. If we're going to be disciples, what, what was number one? Hate. The idea of hate right. and the idea of um, that we've got to give up past priorities, right. abandon past priorities, okay? Right. All priorities. Number two is, there's three points. We won't finish tonight.